Hey, She Slayers, and welcome to another episode of She Slays the Day podcast. I am your host, Dr. Lauren Brunslick, and today we have on Dr. Christina Stitcher, and she's freaking awesome. Um, if you have never experienced a workshop that she has led, well, she's delightful, and you're going to like her, and she's funny, and she brings a ton of energy, and I wish I would have had double the time because there were questions that... I didn't get around to asking, and afterwards I was like, oh, shoot, I wish I would have asked that. So, yes, you're going to love it. Before, though, before we do that, I was thinking the other day, I was just having this thought, and I remember about 10 years ago being really oppositional to the idea that I was a millennial. I What comes before millennial? I think it's Gen X. And I was like, no, because I think technically... I, I should know this by now. It's like 82 or 83 is when uh, you are a millennial. And um, I'm born in 86. And I just remember 10 years ago being like, oh my gosh, no, I am not a millennial. That like young generation, like I wanted to be Gen X. I was like, no, nah. no, I'm so much more Gen X. But I was like, oh, okay, there's quite a few things that I'm a millennial. Now, the other day, I was thinking how... Oh my God, I am grasping onto the fact that I'm a millennial, like, well, because obviously I'm not Gen Z, okay? There's no, like, question there, but, like, if you were like, Lauren, do you wish you were a millennial or Gen X now? I'd be like, oh, millennial, I'm so young, I'm so young, totally a millennial, because uh, nobody's even talking about Gen X. Are they just retired? Like, are they just gone? Why is the only thing we hear about is... Um, Gen Z, Gen X, and my TikTok is full of Gen Zers updating Gen X, or, no, sorry, millennials outfits. And I'm like, oh, oh, and I'm like taking notes and I'm like, yeah, crop, crop that. Okay, wear those shoes instead. Put that ugly boot on with those pants that I don't know how, I don't know what shoes to wear. This is one of my biggest problems right now is with the, uh, I, I embrace the different jeans, okay? I am cool with a lack of skinny jeans. This is fine. I don't mind. But here's my problem. I knew what shoes to wear with skinny jeans. And I don't know what shoes to wear with all of the different weird jeans that exist now. Um, luckily, I'm barefoot in my clinic a lot. And barefoot looks great with all things. Um, but then in the winter, and then you, if you're like, oh, a little sandal or this. I'm in Wisconsin. Okay? So like... These shoes that are not the shoes, these pants that cut off like, you know, they're like high water because they're supposed to be high water. That's cool. Okay. How do I know I'm a millennial? I can't, I can't do high water. I don't think that that's in Gen Z's vocabulary. They're like, what is high water? Those, that's where they're supposed to hit. That's how the jean was designed. And I'm like, no, I am 5'8", and the inseam that I need is 32 inches. Otherwise, most pants are 30 inches. Like, I have done this research. I know. Um, so anyways, what I decided to do is I brought up 10 questions that, so this is a BuzzFeed quiz. If you can honestly say yes to these 10 questions, you're a millennial. So in case you are like me 10 years ago and you're like, no, I am totally not Gen Z. I'm a millennial. Here's your quiz. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, then you're Gen Z. And just trust me, 10 years from now, you are going to be going like, hell yeah, I'm Gen Z. I'm not alpha. I'm totally not alpha. I am young and hip and Gen Z. So just, it's okay. It all comes around. Okay. So question one, did you grow up listening to the delightful music of Destiny's Child or In Sync. Okay? Do you know who those people are? Do you know that Beyonce was in a band? Okay? She was the lead singer, Kelly Rowland, right? She was another person in it. Yeah, she was. I, I, I feel bad. Like, I don't know who the other two people, but I definitely listened to Destiny's Child. TLC? Who sang I Don't Want No Scrub? Weird song. Really weird song. But... I don't know if it was TLC or Destiny's Child. Maybe it was somebody else. Also, for the life of me, I couldn't tell you Backstreet Boys versus NSYNC. Definitely no. Justin Timberlake was in sync, but like if you gave me five songs, I'd be like, oh, I don't know who sang Bye Bye Bye. I don't know who sang I Want It That Way. Here's your homework. Go play 
uh, in sync radio or Backstreet Boys radio. I think Backstreet Boys will probably get a little whinier. So I would say in sync radio um, this afternoon for your adjusting shift. You're welcome. Okay, question two. Did you ever make friendship bracelets, anklets with your besties? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I definitely did. Uh, okay, this one I said no to. Have you ever attended a Harry Potter movie or book midnight premiere? I don't, I think that was probably for the younger millennials. That was not, that was not me. Born in 86, yeah, I, I didn't. Um, okay, have you ever gone to a music store to buy a CD? Mm-hmm, oh my gosh, what was it called, you guys? What was the store that was in all the malls? Pause for a brief second while I do research. Okay, I'm back. I'm pretty sure it was Sam Goody. Um, I knew it had a strong S, um, but yeah, I remember going and Sam Goody is my final answer. Buying CDs. Great. Um, did you ever rock streamers on your bike's handlebars and think they were oh so cool? Uh, hell yeah, I did. When you were growing up, did you think that Miracle Bread, or no, not Miracle Bread, Wonder Bread, sorry, was like the fanciest freaking bread in the world. Um, yeah, it was just white bread, but the kids were dancing on their commercials and I wanted Wonder Bread so bad and my mom would never buy it. Not cool, not cool at all. Have you ever recorded something on a VHS tape? Mm -hmm. It was really complicated. Um, you needed to make sure that it was a blank tape and you weren't re-recording over something. Uh, did you wear jelly sandals? Yeah, for sure. Okay, here's another one. Do you remember timing your bathroom breaks with commercials so you didn't miss a minute of your favorite show? Absolutely. Fun fact, I actually, in second grade, would wake myself up and shower and get my breakfast all by myself early because Aladdin, the cartoon show, not the movie, um, would be on at 6.30. And so I had to like wake up and make sure that I was at the TV by 6.30 because I really wanted to watch Aladdin. So I was like super responsible because I was like, oh, I got to do this. I cannot miss Aladdin. Um, did you ever wear candy necklaces? Yeah. And problem, they would get sticky on your, like, yeah, this is a problem. So there you go, okay? We're, I hope that you, if you were wondering, am I a millennial? If you don't know what any of that stuff is, I'm sorry, you're not. You are Gen Z or you're Gen X, I don't know. Um, but yeah, that, that's my, I'm, I'm sticking to that. Okay, so now we're gonna give a quick shout out to people who make this podcast possible. Sked, who is our clinic uses to send out text reminders. In fact, I got, it's really funny. I just got a text message today that said, hey, Lauren, it's Allison from Blue Hills Chiropractic. I wanted to find a time when Charlie could get in. We haven't seen her in a little bit. And I know for a fact, Allison did not send that. It's just funny because like sometimes my clinic will throw my kids on the schedule um, so like when I know they're coming in to get adjusted in the clinic versus at home. And so they'll put them on the schedule. So it shows that Charlie hasn't been adjusted in two weeks when in reality was well, she has just at home. And so these automatic texts go and it's great. And it, my staff loves it because they don't have to do it. And they can like personalize the text to make it seem like there's a real person on the other end, not some weird robot sending out automated messages. And then also the community of the pediatric experience, um, fantastic community of extremely knowledgeable pediatric chiropractors, Tony Ebel and his entire staff constantly doing so, putting out so much content every month, like answering questions. They have open hours where you can come and ask your specific question. Um, there's staff trainings, there's associate trainings, there's technology trainings on understanding insight, there's communication trainings, like the amount of information that they give with that membership is phenomenal and I cannot recommend it enough if you like seeing kids in clinic. So check them out. We'll have those links below for you. So today, Christina Stitcher, okay. I think this really describes her personality um, because she's so freaking down to earth and modest. When I asked for a four to five sentence bio, she gave me four to five words. Mama, chiropractor, speaker, coach and mentor. 
And I mean, let's be honest, that sums it up. I just had to give my bio out and it included um, something about like that I'm in therapy and I'm sorry if I offend you. Basically, I'm a verbal processor even in my own bio. But she is humble. She is knowledgeable. She is so many things and she's going to provide so so much worth and value to today's interview. So I'm excited for you to hear it. Before we do that, though, it is time to pray. Relax your jaw. Find your heart. Dear God, thank you so much for people like Dr. Christine Stitcher. Thank you for the people listening today. Help them find just their, their place in all of this world is happening and shifting so fast that chaos is happening around us. And so often we don't take a moment, just a moment to breathe, feel your butt sitting on your seat, feel your feet resting on the floor. You are a human being that is emitting an energy. You are emitting a pulse right now as you listen out into the universe. And what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that amazing ability that you have to impact not just people you literally will impact the technology around you you will your your vibrational pulse is something that has been scientifically proven so what are you going to do with that superpower allow god allow spirit in and to just let that light shine out into you, into your patients, into your family, into your friends, into the barista making your latte. By the way, have you had Starbucks pistachio shit lately? Oh my God. It's so good. A little sweet, but yeah, fantastic. Um, God, help us just to realize that power of the human body that you have given us and how magnificent it is and beautifully and wonderfully made. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, here is my conversation with Dr. Christina Stitcher. Enjoy. Okay, so do you know your Enneagram type? No. You don't? I was so excited. No, I'm so glad you asked that as the first question because I thought of that this week and I'm like, this is hilarious. I don't know it. And I know you lead like with every question with that. And I'm like, hmm, I mm. could guess. So I've worked a lot within the, like the disc profile okay. and then the different personalities as well. And I'm like, I just resonate really well within the disc because it's clean and it's easy. It is. And, it's yeah. not, and I think that's where, so I teach that as well. And I'm like, let's just start somewhere and start recognizing how to communicate and bridge gaps. Yeah. The problem with the Enneagram is it is so complicated. Like I don't even use it, um, as like an employee test very reliably, mm -hmm. um, because it just takes so much work. I find so many chiropractors are mistyped as Enneagram threes. They okay. think they're three, yeah. uh, because threes tend to be like entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And so when you're taking a quiz, you answer you know, a yeah. quiz is like, <laughs> mm, do you often like, you know, whatever, asking a question. And because they own a business, they answer it like a three would, but right. not actually a three. And so it's funny because I'll like be talking to someone. So this is like one of the biggest faux pas is like somebody who says, well, you're not supposed to diagnose people, but I fuck that up all the right. time. <laughs> By the end of this hour, we will know you're at your grand <laughs> But the other thing that you're really not supposed to do is when somebody says they are something mm -hmm. is to say like, I don't think you are. Oh, oh yeah. That could be, well, the flip side, I look at this is as chiropractors, I talk a lot from like speaking from here, like our business has to be here. When we're a doctor, we're here. And that's the reason we give everything away. If we're ever asked to make any financial decisions in the moment, of course, we're gonna give chiropractic care away to the entire right. community and the next community over. And I'm like, so you can't make financial decisions like this because right. when you're in your heart with well, us, wonderful service mindset, but you got to go business mode, which means step back, have a separate time and place even, and then now make business decisions so you can take care of your family and have a legacy. Yeah. And so I think it, a lot of times it's like those, and like a lot of the personalities, especially the Enneagram, I think you're exactly right. It's like, well, I'm a business owner. So I must answer like this. And the answer is no, actually I'm a split personality right. because we're chiropractors. Yeah. And then there's some of them that uh, people just want to be. So like a lot right. of people think they're a seven because sevens come across very like fun and like threes are like, they, they kind of always are like, oh, threes are successful. 
I was like, no, you, I want to be that. Yeah. yeah, like, no, yeah and yeah. it's like, oh, but then I can always tell like when I like, I'll make a joke about the bad part of a three mm-hmm. and they like, don't get it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, not you're, you. not, you're not <laughs> famous fuck. And they're like, no. And I was like, mm, you're not a three. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, and then you got women in general are just caregivers. And so yep. then they get diagnosis too. So yeah, it's complicated. All right. Yep. All right. We'll figure out. So what's your disc? So I'm mostly dominant not a surprise there. So I'm dominant. And then, um, I'm trying to think my next one in is I'll hit a little bit. Dominance really my, my main, it's like, it just, and it's, I love how it. Deal, how yeah. do you deal with confrontation? I do pretty well with it. It's one that sometimes I'll even egg it on, but at uh-huh. the same time, it's like, I'm not afraid of a conversation, but I also have a little hidden white in me because I, I'm a people pleaser. Everyone's a people pleaser, I think in many ways. And it's like, so I've had to work really hard to say, okay, I understand you want to make sure this situation goes away, but you need to attack it. And you need to like, you need to have this conversation. So it's kind of fun to see where the different things will pop in. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm just over here gathering data. Don't I know. Mind oh, me. I know. You go for it. I love it. Okay. So what is your story? Like I, you and I have only met in like, I took an MC2 class and you were teaching the second day. Um, And so, and really I was just a student there learning and stuff. So I didn't get to interact with you or anything like that. How long ago was that? um, Four years, maybe. That's awesome. I love it. I was like, oh, I didn't know. That's yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it it was, I think it was probably pre-podcast, pre all of that. So, Mm -hmm. um, but what is your, what is your story? Yeah. Well, how much time do we right. really? We got plenty. We got I plenty. know. I will interrupt 72 times with I, questions. Okay. I love it. So I have, well, and I'll say I've been in chiropractic, like in practice for 19 years. Okay. So I have a huge story within chiropractic, but I was raised in Maine. I'm very proud of my New England roots and with the last name Kill. And so you, with the last name Kill, you have to be a doctor. Um, and I only knew like medical. And yeah. so I was always thinking medical. I actually had, um, I got a traumatic spondy in my, my sophomore year in high school, saw the chiropractor, saw the PT, saw the acupuncturist, saw, um, saw a doctor of osteopathy. Like I I went and saw everyone and I didn't have an amazing experience with chiropractic. Like I just, I literally remember to this day, him saying, you'll have horrible pregnancies. That's what I remember. And I, and obviously it tells us, it doesn't mean that's what he said. And it doesn't mean he didn't teach you 20 other things, but it's like, that's what I heard. And, and I never, like, I didn't have a miracle in chiropractic because of it. So then it's like, I fast forward in a real brief. My mom was actually in a car crash. My senior year in high school ended up in a spinal fusion as a result of it. Then a year later, she starts seeing a chiropractor for care. That is when I've already started university. So I went out to Utah, which is where I am now to come to school, um, started university here and watch my mom start improving her health. Like her health was decimated from this crash. And then further because of this, the fusion that really, maybe she needed it, but you and I both know the statistics, like she probably didn't. And it was first line of defense rather than the 50th line, like it should have been. But chiropractic care is what literally like changed her life, saved her life. And she's like, Christina, you should be a chiropractor. And I would literally thought, yeah, hell no. Like I want to be a real doctor and I can like chiropractors. I can respect chiropractors, but I'm going to be a real doctor. I'll refer to them. Yes, exactly. So I had very much a bias without a good base, but I had a bias against chiropractors. And why so the, was that? What was, I don't know. Because you were in college at the time? Which means I knew everything. Like that's right. yeah, me too. part of it. Because yeah. yeah. I knew everything. And Utah's a very medical state. And so like chiropractic wasn't even really talked about as an undergrad option. Um, and so I think that's part of it. But then this just mindset that medical doctors like we they rule the world and they know everything. And it's and of course every medical doctor is like obviously as we talk to them they're frustrated they don't get to do what they want to do and their hands are tied and we have so much more freedom as chiropractors but there's still that pedestal of course that we all know about but I just I had this inherent bias and here's where I love that I can share this because I was an EMT like I was medical and I loved it like I love blood guts and gore and I I missed that part um but I will say the best thing that happened to me was I was because of my bias it really took a a moment to change my life. And that was where I did a favor to my mom. And I went and checked out Parker 
as an option. And I was on the campus tour in the microbiology room when like an inspiration, like the size of a two by four, the weight of a two by four hitting me beside the head to say, you need to be a chiropractor and you need to be here as quickly as possible. And for me, that moment, of course, changed my life only because I acted on it. If I hadn't acted on it, of course, like yep. my life would have been exactly where it, it would have been. But because I chose and leaned into that and leaned into the discomfort of, holy shit, now I'm going to be the chiropractor that you've just been biased against. And I have to fight for a profession. And I remember really wrestling with that at the beginning of school going, I'm going to have to fight for my profession. You're an eight. I'm sorry. You're an Enneagram eight. Okay. There's like, we can end the thing. Like such a visual. Okay. okay. Yeah. Podcast okay. over. Anyway. Okay. We'll look, I'll look it up. Okay, cool. <laughs> I love it. They're fighting for the profession. It's, yeah. Well, honestly, that is what drives me. And that's what it was, is in my very early time as a student, I realized that we fight for the things we believe in. Why would I not fight for my profession? And then what happened through that process, I was never like, once I went into school, I wasn't biased against chiropractic. Cause obviously it was like, I knew, like, I just had a knowingness, this was right. And then it was like, give me everything I can. And let me evaluate and be wrong. I was totally okay that I had made a judgment call for vaccines, that I had made a judgment call for surgeries and for medications and go, let's blow those out of the water. And let's, what's the truth? And what's the, so yeah. So it was a really cool time in my life where it's like, I could totally just like pass that old person and let myself develop. And, and I did, it's like, I really, I chiropractic has been a talent for me. Um, like boards were never an issue. Grades were okay. But it was like, I just, I've really done well at this. And at the same time, I knew very quickly, whole nother story is how my husband and I got together and married within like two and a half months, right before I started chiropractic school, we're still together. So somehow it's worked out. Um, which was like crazy because, then I know we're going to have a family at some point. So I immediately start looking at like kids and pregnancy and I fell in love with it in school. So I had actually taken my entire ICPA fellowship, the back in the old days program, right before I graduated, had all that done and then moved to Utah and I started a family practice. It wasn't, no, it wasn't a family practice. It is now. It was a pediatric and pregnancy practice. Okay. And I think there's a big importance to say the difference between the two, because I've chosen to become a family practice now to be more inclusive, mm -hmm. but then it was very pregnancy, very pediatric and like no one else and, um, and what it serves in time and all that wonderful things. But when I moved here, I was told by many doctors in the state, I wouldn't be successful. I was like the fourth female that ever came into the state that opened a practice here or not. Why, ever. Why did they think you were not going to be successful? Because the, in our state is a very medical okay. uh, approach okay, as chiropractic. Back to Utah. Western states. Yes, exactly. Okay. Back in Utah now. And so Western states influence here, I think is part of it, but it also is like this boys club, which I think is what we get to deal with is, I know it's what we get to deal with as women, but especially us gray haired women, it's like, Younger women, you're welcome. Yes, it's still hard, but it's nothing like it was. And I look around and, and it's so cool to know the statistic, more than 51% of the students in school are now female. So the whole ties are changing to, again, inclusive. I don't, I am totally against female is our future, which like minimizes the man. I'm like, right. no, we need to work together. And so, but I love sharing this part because I came in going, and they're telling me you're not going to be successful. And luckily I didn't listen. Like I just didn't hear them and open this practice. And, and I, it was successful. Like I did really well, very quickly as a doc and had my, had my babies through practice and everything else. And so I now go like 19 years later and all the mistakes, tons of them, all the learning lessons, all the families, all the facts that like, I got to help take care of these babies that are now, well, we're 19 years, which we're in Utah, which means they're getting married soon. And it's, it's just, it's a blessing. It is, it's the wildest thing to be part of this profession. I got to go and teach um, as faculty at Parker for a year. I chose to stay for only a year, but it's like, I love, I absolutely love what my life has become because of chiropractic. And it's really one that I'm like, universe, I'm, I'm a good girl, at like surrendering universe. Like, where do we need to go? And let's have fun. All right. Well, I wrote down seven questions. Okay. I love okay. it. So let's go back to student. Yeah. Now being able to change your mind or being open to acknowledging that you might've been wrong mm -hmm. or, you know, that is a unique skill. 
So how do you like, and I do think it's something that, you know, every chiropractor is gonna be like, well, I don't, I know I don't need to change my mind on vaccines and I know I don't need to, you know, like, <laughs> but like, how do you recommend we continue to like keep our minds open when we're so confident that we have the answer? Because like a lot of times when you look at like chiropractic for progress for chiropractic foundation, you know, and all of that. And it's like, okay, I don't have any intention of um, being a flu shot clinic in my, in my clinic. Um, I don't have any intention of getting it. I don't have any intention of making it. But like when we do talk about collaborative care being the future, do you agree with that? Okay, so that's a loaded question because you got a few in there, which I love. So the first thing I'm going to answer, because I want to go back to collaborative, but let me first answer the mindset of like, is it okay to be wrong? I just listened to this recently and it was at the end of each year, you need to be able to write down what did I like, what did I learn that I was wrong about the year before? And the more things, and I was like, oh, I love that. And it was like, if you can get like more than five things that you were wrong about then you know that you had a learning year, an experience, like an experience-based year. And I was like, oh, I like that. So it's, it's very much the, is it okay to be wrong? And the answer, of course it is, but it's our ego. And so we got to shed the ego. We got to acknowledge that, like the model behavior we had from our parents, which really is deep sea. Like, honestly, let's be a parent. Mm-hmm. And as soon as you're a parent, you realize like, holy shit, we don't know what we're doing. And we yeah. thought we did. And every advice that we gave when we weren't a parent, yeah, you know, that's all out the window because you just, you got to learn that you just, you got to try what, what works at this time. I, it's luckily something I will say lucky that I had it already because obviously they should say that to you. And I don't think I've a voice that before. Like I could literally shed this whole mindset and say, okay, I have so much to learn and I really want to do this well. I have to, I love that you went to vaccines because I, I, and you know, I teach on vaccines all over the world. Um, but I had a moment and it was back as it was only like eight years ago, eight or nine years ago. And I had a pediatrician bought our building that I was in at the time. And she brought another doctor down with her and very nice. Let's just talk. And then they like hammered me on vaccines and like, I was wrong. And why did I not send people to the C- um, CDC's website and to the American <laughs> Academy of Pediatric and Surgeons and to the pediatrician, like they hammered me so well that literally in my head, I'm thinking, oh, hell, I have swayed all these patients in all this time, and maybe I'm wrong. And even in that moment, I could say I was wrong, but it's like, I remember coming out of that room, like, and my husband said it, because he saw me, he's like, you were like a deer in the headlights, look, because it was like, what the hell, you had just been barraged. And it took me about 30 minutes to come out of that and go, what the hell just happened? And what just happened was I was attacked systematically from two pediatricians who tried to take me on And then it made me realize, okay, first of all, I don't know this well enough. If I'm willing to like fall to that, Mm -hmm. that quickly, then I really don't know it as well as I thought I did. And then what the heck is happening to our parents that are going into a pediatrician's office that are hoping for the best for their baby. And if this happened to me with everything I know, and it made me go deep into the research. Because even then, which was a beautiful thing, I said, okay, then obviously I don't know the research well enough. And maybe I am wrong. And I dove back into the research again, trying to be as unbiased at that point. And everything I read was, girl, you know, these things are not okay, but it was like, you need the research. And so I dove so strong into the research. And that's when I really developed the vaccine classes that I now teach all over because of that experience, because it gave me such understanding and empathy for these parents to go, this is how they get railroaded in an office. And that's totally inappropriate. It's totally unfair, but we need to give them more tools. Okay. So then, how, mm-hmm. how do you, I'm sorry, we are going to go on a tangent, it. but it, like, it, it, this is a big issue for me mm-hmm. because we have three to five minute appointments. Yep. Okay? And I don't know how you can't, you can't I, do it in three to five minutes. Yes, and, so, and like, and so no. the number of times that literally it's embarrassing mm-hmm. as a family practice, how many times a, I've adjusted a kid and then the parents are like, well, on to get some shots. And I'm just like, oh, oh, good luck. Don't give them Tylenol. Uh Uh-huh. 
Right. Yes. And glad they got adjusted because that's the one thing I can say, like, thank God they got adjusted. But here's the one thing I've learned on my new patient paperwork. I asked them, I have um, two questions that everyone gets asked, including the pediatricians that come in as patients. Did like it asks like all the vaccines, what have your child received? And then the first question is, did you know you had a choice about vaccines? Yes or no? Would you like more information on the other side? Yes or no? If they tell me, yes, I knew I had a choice and no, I don't want any information. We move on because I, that's where like accept them where they are, love them where they are. Because the worst thing I can do as a chiropractor is say, if you don't vaccinate your child, like if you don't vaccinate, then that's what you need to do. But if you do vaccinate, you're no longer welcome here. Like that, there's chiropractors who do that. And I actually say, I don't think that's fair. Like, I think that's just as bad as a pediatrician saying, if you don't vaccinate, don't come in. But I have a lot of parents that will say to me, yes, or sorry, no, I didn't know I had a choice. And yes, I would like some information. So then now we extend with how do you go with that information? Send them. So if you don't, if you only have the three to five minutes, have a list of documentaries because thank goodness we now don't have to do the like work every time and just send them there and say, here's some documentaries, here's some short ones, two hour ones, a greater good, it's a great simple one to start with. If you want longer ones, the truth about vaccines, vaccines revealed, those are amazing documentaries to send them to as well. And then I teach a class and I teach it on a regular basis. And I in teach the clinic. in my clinic and What's in the public. So I like, I change the name up all the time. Sometimes it's immunity, sometimes it's vaccines. And it's like, cause I don't like, it doesn't have to have a certain name because it's all about like, what's your choice. My biggest belief, and this is how I lead all my vaccine classes. First of all, I set a rule. No one can like, no one can um, heckle me. No one can be in that room to create chaos. They need to leave if that's what they're in the room for. So I've taught to big groups. I've never had an issue when I say that from the very beginning ground rule. The second is I admit that I'm biased because I've done my research and everyone's biased. And so let's acknowledge the bias. And I'm here to share my side and what I know and what the research. And I said, and I will not speak for me. I will give you nothing but research from here on out. And I do that very carefully. And then the third part behind it is I'm not there to make anyone mad against their pediatrician or against their spouse or against their um, cousins. And because again, like that's what I see, especially in this state. And I don't mean it doesn't happen in other states, but it's like families are having to justify to their in-laws and to their extended family of why they're not vaccinating. My answer is you should never, why is it even a topic of conversation? This is between you and your partner. So but I have to also say this, like I've chosen to put the black mark on me or they're, or they're like total crosshairs are on me yeah. and I've leveraged my position very well in the state. Like I've served as president of our state association. I'm now on our licensing board for the state. So I do a lot with NBCE and, and FLCB because of it. And I, and I enjoy all that stuff. And I do that because I want subluxation based chiropractic in those circumstances And I know that what I'm doing, I'm allowed legally to do. And so I tell all the chiropractors in the area, I'm like, you don't have to teach the class if you're not comfortable. Send them to my class because I'm not there to get them as a patient. I'm there to educate. So it is very much this altruistic and it is because I want people to know they have a choice and that like, and then the other, like, and I have to mention it because it has affected me. You may not see the effects of vaccines for 10 to 20 years. And I was fully vaccinated all because of course there's my history fully vaccinated yep. and I reacted to the HEP B series in college with fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue and, and I had a nurse was the one that put the two and two together and said you need to report that and I didn't know where to report that I didn't know you could report that even in college and then 20 years later I get a diagnosis of cancer. And so I look at that and then dive into that research and go holy shit we're not immune, uh-huh. because if we were raised medically. Yep. We need to know better. What can we do now to not wait for that diagnosis and more than just live the chiropractic lifestyle? That's the other thing I have to say. It's like living the chiropractic lifestyle is amazing and wonderful other than the whole limitation of matter and what it has been through. And so what else do we need to do to help the body detox at the deepest level to pull parasites and pull the heavy metals and pull the toxicities in your body from something that was never meant to be in our body? So how do we stay open if the goal is collaborative care? Okay. Thank you. So here's my mindset with collaborative care. I love collaborative care. As long as I'm in charge of what I get to do. (laughs) When someone says I will direct chiropractic care and when it's appropriate and how it's appropriate and the schedule's appropriate, I would never do that. That's not collaborative care. Instead, I believe the answer to collaborative care is we need to stay in our lane. Subluxation based chiropractic care is exactly the answer to collaborative care. 
when we start trying to do the PT and the injections and try to get prescriptive rights, all of a sudden that's not collaborative. We're saying, no, we want the entire playground to ourselves. Can I be judgy in a, like in a, um, in, in, no, can I be ignorant? That's, mm -hmm. that's the question. I'm, yeah. So I picture collaborative chiropractors being not the, like the ones who are like, yeah, I'm going to graduate and go work for a hospital. Mm -hmm. I don't picture them being the subluxation based ones. However, right? like I would love it if they were, because yeah. this is what, and this is what we've seen in sports medicine. This is what we've seen. And the biggest one is sports medicine. And I've talked a lot of, uh, with these docs, if you go into sports medicine as a chiropractor and you try to tape and you try to give them exercises and you try to do all the soft tissue work, you piss off all the PTs that are working with them and you very quickly get kicked out of that team because the PT and the athletic trainers are in charge. If you go in and you stick to neurologically based chiropractic care, you're going to stick around longer because they don't get to like, they can't do what we do. And they see where we come in as a missing piece and integral, and at the same time, not trying to take over mm -hmm. hospital. Now, again, this is still my medical speaking. I like, I would work in a hospital in a heartbeat. Like if I could be in that NICU all day, every day, just circling that. And I've snuck in enough times and we'll, we can yeah. talk about the legalities of that. Cause we should don't be doing that guys because you shouldn't, but right. it's like to be able to do those things and help out and see miracles, literally the miracles that I've seen. And I know you've seen, and we've been part of with these precious little babies that weigh a pound and weigh two pounds. And it's like, and their lives are changed in an instant. Why would we not want that in mm -hmm. a hospital? And how, how horrible it is that we don't have that in a hospital. And so I look at this of going, I do see collaboration, not as our future, but I see it as one of the avenues that we can really help. And I actually think we are more beneficial to a hospital setting. If we stayed in this realm of, I don't want to do PT. You have amazing PTs who do an amazing job and they know it better than I do. I'm really, really good at chiropractic care. I'm actually one of the best at what I do. Let me focus on this. Yeah. And then you'll see miracles happen within a hospital or within a, a physical therapy facility or within whatever it's going to be, because now I honor and respect. And that's the biggest difference. I honor and respect every other profession. I don't tell the PTs what to do. I don't tell the medical docs what to do. I actually expect them to be amazing because I would hope that they expect me to be amazing. And when I show up every day for my patients, I expect myself to be amazing and thorough and communicate at the highest level. And as a result, I share that responsibility with other providers and expect everyone to level up because I believe our patients deserve that. Hey, She Slayers. When I first started practice, I thought I needed to dress a certain way for patients to trust me. And I spent hours trying to design communication and marketing materials that worked. After 12 years of practice, here's a couple things I've learned. One, I don't have to wear dress pants and button ups for a patient to take me seriously. And two, why recreate the wheel when a design professional has already done all the work for me? Well Aligned offers solutions in both of these categories. They have the coolest and most comfy chiropractic shirts that will showcase your personality, as well as beautifully designed communication and marketing tools to help drive new patients, get more referrals, and gain better retention in your practice. From the best chiropractic apparel to modern patient education materials, Well Aligned has you covered. All She Slayers get 10% off plus free shipping on orders of $75 or more with promo code SHESLAYS. Visit www.wellaligned.com to save. Hi, friends. I wanted to take a quick break from the episode to make sure you all know about the cool stuff we have happening over on Patreon. This is a platform where I can offer you extra content, behind the scenes interviews, quick trainings, and exclusive trainings answering your exact question live, back to back with me. It's a way for me to more directly interact with you and post some fun things that would never be in the normal weekly episodes. To check out what we're doing and to sign up, click the link in the show notes. Hey, She Slayers, so many of you connect with my story as a chiropractor because I started 
all wrong. Years into practice, I had to completely turn it around from being an insurance and pain-based model to a thriving subluxation-based cash practice. I have a lot of ways that that happened, but I am not exaggerating when I say the number one thing I changed was adding CLA's insight scanning technology. The insight helped grow our practice from 300 people a week to over 500 a week in the course of one year, purely by showing objective findings and providing reports to patients. So many docs I talk to struggle to communicate the why behind a care plan when the patient's pain goes away in a few visits. They struggle to keep patients after insurance stops paying. They don't know how to explain why a kid benefits from chiropractic care, even though they have no symptoms. They don't do progress exams because what am I going to do to show the patient progress? I am telling you every single thing I just said, my answer to the doc is, are you using insight scanning technology in your clinic yet? Because it's the solution to all of those issues. If you have questions, the staff at CLA is absolutely incredible and will help answer those questions and help implement this big change into your practice. Click the link below in the show notes as She Slays listeners get preferred pricing and hundreds of dollars off their purchase. So within the idea of staying in your lane, have you had pediatricians um, or obstetricians um, come at you for your talking about vaccines and medications and so, oh, I love that. I thought you were going to go a different way with it. I'm like, well, they come after me. Of course they will, because heaven forbid, they say no chiropractic care all the time. And that's a whole different conversation. That could be a legal conversation as well. But when it comes to, so in our, our scope of practice, we made sure, and this is why I love that I, I am on the licensing board. This is why you guys, like you're listening to this, you need to prepare yourselves to get on your state associations, leverage yourself as a leader in your state, because if you're not doing it, who's doing it? And if you're pissed off that the medical cartel is running chiropractic is because you're sitting in your practice serving thousands of patients, which I love and appreciate and it's needed. But if you don't serve the profession, then like it's going to be taken over because that's who has the time to do it. So you have to find the time is the answer. Like you just have to. So the answer to that though is in my state. Yeah, I hope I'll piss off. If I don't piss off a couple of people, Lauren, then I didn't do this <laughs> no. part right either. No, it's so, great. Okay. So in our, in our scope, we are allowed to talk about medication. We're not allowed to prescribe. We're not allowed to take people off of it, but we're allowed to discuss medication and that's specified in our state law. So as a result, I believe that I can take that line in a very clean way and say, of course, we can discuss the benefits and the risks of any medication, which includes vaccination. And again, when I come back to something like a vaccination or a medication, I'm never against the doctor who prescribed it. I assume that every pediatrician has been sold the bill of goods that you're a bad parent if you don't vaccinate. And they really believe that, that we're uneducated, that we don't care and we're the problem. Like they really hold that. And that's just really sad and it's changing, but that's, that's the bias. So if I can acknowledge that the flip side is I'll say to my patients, it's going, I probably wouldn't even tell your patient, like, I won't tell your doctor, like you can, but probably having the same conversation with your pediatrician is not going to go the same way. Right. Even talking about to your pediatrician that you've been now seeing me for your yeah. child and for their health. And that's why the ear infections went away. That's why the colic went away. They're probably not going to understand it. See it. Like we're just two different mindsets and the flip side. So I've obviously I teach quite a bit, but like every new patient in our practice goes through a new patient class. We call it a special appointment. It's taught on a Wednesday night or Tuesday during lunch. And everyone's required to talk, to come to that class. And some of our patients kick up and go, I don't want to ever be required to go to anything. And my answer is then probably not the right office for you because this is our opportunity to spend 45 minutes to an hour with you to help you understand the paradigm that we come from. So instead of those three to five minute blocks that I try to have to shove everything into, I have systems and procedures in the practice to help educate at a higher level and not make it so intensive of the burden to fill that time with them. So now they can understand this is how we raise healthy children. This is how we view raising healthy children. And I don't even have to mention the word vaccine in that class because we don't, they can already understand that we're talking, I'm not anti-drug and surgery. I lead with that all the time, but there's a time and place. And I don't believe the time and place is the first place. 
And that's where we help people understand. And then the really big thing that parents understand with us, once they stop or once they start thinking about vaccines, they realize, why am I going to pediatrician so often? Mm -hmm. right? You're going on a vaccine schedule. And if you're only going for vaccines and for height and weight, we actually have a scale in our office for babies, because if the parents are worried, go weigh them in our office. If you want to measure them, here's some tape, like a, a tape measure. You can measure them in our office. I'm not going to, but you can. And it's one of saying, if you want, if you truly want a wellness visit, then that's what chiropractic care is. Yeah. And I will explain it exactly like that. I said, but in, again, the reason that people are concerned is you have to, you have to have a doctor. You don't have to have a pediatrician. You have to have someone who's a port of entry physician or a provider for your family because it tells the state that you care about your child's health and right. that someone's overlooking their growth. I said, a chiropractor in this state can count. Did you know that a chiropractor can count as a port of entry physician in this state as your primary care provider in this state because of what we, what our training is? And so most of our parents have chosen to stop seeing the pediatrician and keep them in their back pocket is the way that I like to say it, just in case there's a funky rash that I don't recognize, yeah. something I'm not comfortable with. I like that they have a pediatrician, but if you truly want wellness care, right. this is what we do. And so again, yeah. it's changing those perceptions. And what I'm really doing is, I hope, is I'm showing more time and place appropriateness rather than this mindset of, I have to see the pediatrician at two weeks and at six weeks and eight weeks, because we're really going to do vaccines. Well, yeah. And it's, I mean, anybody who has a kid who says they're not extremely thankful for what the hospital provides, like, you know, we, we, um, it's like right off the exit to come into our town. And so we drive by a hospital all the time. And sometimes our kids will just be like, how come we never go to the doctor? I'm like, you do, you go to the welcome. doctor. <laughs> you went like, remember three years ago, like, when you were like really sick for that month and that call, we went in. <laughs> the way um, it should be. The way it should be of like, yeah. And what's it, really great is like, I'm just seeing so much. I don't know if you're big in to TikTok at all, but like there is so much like Eastern and Native American medicine that is like coming out like as like new information. Yes to like young millennials and Gen Z of like, I've got patients being like, well, I don't know. I watched this TikTok and I've been putting like garlic paste on her feet. And I'm like, fuck yeah, you yes, are. Exactly. That is fantastic. Mm -hmm. So things are, things are changing. Okay. Well, and that's, that's the best thing I'll say that's came out of this whole last few year ridiculousness is that patients are seeing, people are seeing, I'll change that even better. People are seeing this obvious medicine is fear-based. It's the only way to live is in fear. And people are choosing. They're, they're coming in saying, I don't want my family being raised like this. I know there must be a different way. And so people are rushing. And we're seeing this, of course, like family practices and chiropractic have blown up because the, the community, the, po the population has literally been shown the black and white. Mm -hmm. And we've known it. It's like, that's what's kind of funny. They're like, did you know? And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, really? Like, that's fascinating. Yeah, honey, I've known this a lot longer than you because we've been pissed off about it, but we've been there to serve. And I think that's the secret. We're pissed off, but we serve and we serve and we serve and we serve and we kept on showing up. And that was the most important thing we could do during all the shutdowns and ridiculousness is we kept on showing up. We were the consistent ones that kept on the same message. And that's when I coach all my docs. I was like, do not come out against COVID. Do not talk against this. Instead, keep on communicating the way you've always communicated, which is to build up health and build up life from within and the intelligence of the body within. Keep that communication constant because now they're listening even better. Mm -hmm. And so then what happened with our practices is everyone grew and we grew with the right type of patients and it was just so much more fun. And I go, this is the wave. Like, this is what we've been waiting for. The whole, like, look around the room and who's the answer to the future. It's like, yeah, we are. So now step up, put on the pants and go, okay, what is this going to require from me? And the answer is it's going to require us to be more certain. It's going to require us to communicate at the highest level. It's going to require us to have a team who's excited, who's passionate because we serve our team. We take care of our team. And so together we have ownership in this mindset of, the health of our community does matter. And we're tired of the hospitals being constantly full of sick and dying and diseased kids and adults and people who don't think they have a choice and go, 
when is enough enough? Well, I think all of us should be fired up over the last few years and go, okay, it's, we have to take the lead and no one else is there to save our profession. It's us doing the work in our own practices and then serving at the higher levels and elevating our profession. So if you had to predict the future, you know, we talked in the beginning how like you, your ability to see that your opinions for years were, I don't know, I don't want to say wrong, but you know, you switch. Right. Don't align. Mm -hmm. How, how do you see the medical community, the pediatricians responding to this wave? Cause like, yes, it's easier for patients and parents. And I mean, and by easier, I put air quotes because there is nothing easy when you're a parent who has, you know, you're on four children, you have fully vaccinated all of them. It is not easy to hear something that you cannot undo. And so I feel like the evolution of the brain is to protect and validate. Protect Absolutely. and validate your decisions. So it's not easy for a parent, but at least their career isn't based on it. Like, well, I shouldn't say pediatricians' careers. Well, no, they really it. are. are. <laughs> um, but like, a good majority, we'll say. <laughs> mm -hmm. How do you see the next 10 years playing out? Like, not in an idealistic way, but like, what would you, if you had to predict what's going to happen over the next 10 years with that, this new information? Yeah, I think... What I've seen being in practice so long is that pediatricians are more open. That's what I see happening. I don't see them going the way of vaccines ever being an issue. I only see more vaccines coming out. I only see more, um, I do see more control because we're seeing that cons consistently and mm -hmm. that we're going, and honestly, I think the worst thing a pediatrician can do, and again, it's, we can look at all of our, all of our states and I have a feeling it's the same, a pediatrician who's very like stuck in, you only vaccinate. I'm the answer to everything. And this is the patient base I'm going to have. They're always seeing new patients because they're always open. Every single pediatrician that's open to the conversation that mm -hmm. honors the parent, they're not accepting new patients anymore. They're all full. And I look at this of going, if they want to make a business pivot, not even a philosophical or anything else, if they just made a business pivot to be more successful, all they have to say is, I'm okay with autonomy. Like they can say that, like that's them <laughs> where they're not, they're really not okay with it, but they can say, we will respect the parents' wishes. We will educate them on what we believe is right, but we will respect their wishes. And my answer is that's all that we really want as a parent is respect my wishes. And then I actually see them doing quite well. The hope now, and it's not just idealistic, but the hope is because I'm seeing it happen more and I'm seeing pediatricians actually start to refer to us, which is wonderful and great. And I really don't care. And I mean that I really don't care because they're not they're going to be the driving force in my practice. That being said, pediatricians that are open to alternative things for their practice base, I see them being successful and lasting longer. And what has happened, of course, with the AMA and the Wilk case and everything else that we've gone through, that generation is, is leaving. And they mm -hmm. quickly left during COVID because of all the issues. And so we're now at the first time, I believe, an opportunity to work with, with other doctors that weren't raised in this anti-chiropractic, they're biased, but not anti. And so then of, we only need a handful, let's be honest, of docs that go, hey, like, let me just hear, let me just be willing to listen to these stories of parents and then go, okay, maybe they're not all shady little chiropractic little shits that they think we are and go, actually, hold on, that really happened? that's cool. Maybe I'll send another patient. Cause that's really what they'll do is if they hear one story, they'll be like, okay, cool. They'll pass it off. They hear a few stories. They're probably going to send a patient over and see what happens with that patient. Mm -hmm. And I always say that to docs. It's like, when you get a referral, you got to realize like they're testing you out a referral from a midwife. They're testing you out to see if you're good or not. And the biggest thing that I want for my patients, I'm not going to treat them any different. I'm not going to give them less than what they need to please the pediatrician right. or to please the midwife. Cause well, they only need that one adjustment to put them into labor and go, well, I wish I'd seen them 20 weeks ago, but, or heck, I would have seen them even 38 weeks ago. But as we're looking at this, my answer is we need to stay true to what we do in our communication and what we believe in. And then people keep on choosing in. I really see chiropractic. I remember graduating. I graduated in 2004 and we were told we were part of, we were going to lead 
the next trillion dollar industry, which is wellness. Chiropractors would lead it. Well, the trillion dollar industry of wellness did come to pass. Chiropractors were definitely not the leaders of it, and we weren't even considered part of it. So we need to claim something and we need, and I'm totally like, I'm okay. Not claiming wellness. I'm totally cool. Claiming the brain and claiming neurologically based and claiming the nervous system. Like let's claim it. And the research that's coming out. And the sad part is like, aside from Heidi Havoc and her work, like she's amazing. And I like, that's what I mean. Aside from her, a lot of the neurological based research is coming out. It's coming from the PTs. They're doing the research and going, holy shit. Did you know what the nervous system actually does when it comes to function <laughs> of the body? And we're like, yeah, we've yeah. actually written all these green books. Now you're proving it. And then we have people like Heidi Havoc that are doing massive research that are showing what we knew. That's the coolest things like reading through these yeah. green books now, like get the green books, you guys, because you read through them and go, holy shit, the research is now proving what was said right. 50 years ago, hundred years ago and go like, we don't need, if we need to wait to be proven medically, like the whole people that come in and say, show me the research. I go, here's the door because I'm not going to waste my time giving you the research because I have too many people to take care of. I think that's the other mistake that chiropractors make is they feel like they have to convince everyone into care. And my answer is no, no, no. Serve the people who are ready to be taken care of and let go of the ones who are not ready. Yeah. They'll come back around or they'll circle and cycle however they do. But I can only give my love and my best to the people who show up. So I focus really, really hard on them. Okay. So you have, um, I was going to say affiliates, but it's not that word. Um, this might be a complicated question for you because of boards or past work experiences yeah. or things like this. So when I was in school, our, um, was it, a, I think it was our infectious disease teacher or it was our pediatrics teacher. I don't remember which one. They both had the same stance on it. Um, the only thing we really learned about vaccines, I remember her going and say, saying like basically word for word, I wish that chiropractors would pick a different hill to die on. Yep. Like vaccines work. They've always worked. I wish you would stop. Like I wish chiropractors would stop now. So the question is like, I have like the memory of a goldfish. So like I've read some books, I've heard some studies, but like, I'm such a gut led person where I'm like, well, I know, mm -hmm. I know what I need to do. I feel very good about what I'm doing. I feel very good. But when tested, like if, if I had a pediatrician, like yeah. finger wagon in front of me, I'd go like, oh God, um, is something about a spike protein? Uh, like, so how, how do we get, because I have a feeling we have a ton of chiropractors out there who are like very comfortable with their stance of not vaccinating, but they don't really have the back, the like information to back it up. You have a lot of chiropractors who are very comfortable saying you have a subluxation, but they don't really know what the heck that is. They feel very comfortable saying I'm a neurological based chiropractor and Michael Hall schooled a bunch of us in an ICPA class, just being like, you guys, this is neurology. You learned this. And I'm like eight years into practice being like, no, I didn't. forgot that is <laughs> I let go of my boards. Like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So like, how do we keep, oh, and then my continuing ed is like bullshit stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, how do we get chiropractors equipped with research and like true knowledge so they can go to their family practice, so they can go to their clinic on Monday and politely and kindly stand confidently in truth, not truth in their heart, not truth in their gut, but mm -hmm. like, this is what the information is. I think the first answer I'd say to that is we have to be uncomfortable, like being willing to be uncomfortable to say, I really don't know this well enough. And like that moment with a pediatrician was obviously if I fell that quickly, then I don't know it well enough. And that was a driving force for me to invest a ton of time and money actually paying for research to start really diving into it. 
one thing that I do is like, I'm teaching my vaccine class um, again early this next year. Like I ended up, I recorded my last class is like two and a half hours long. And every time I teach within MC2 and teach tunnel pediatrics, I teach a little bit of the vaccine stuff because I want, I just pepper it everywhere I go. I just share a little bit of information. Like the quote that the U S Supreme court has deemed vaccines as unavoidably unsafe. So if you just wonder when people say that vaccines are safe, go, well, the U S Supreme court has deemed them unavoidably unsafe. And it's like, it's important just to grab those words and, and to know little snippets. We don't, like, I'm the same as you. Like, I'm like, what is that quote? I've said it a million times and it's gone. I need a PowerPoint to read it. That being said, like if it's something, and we can put it in the show notes, I'm happy to share it. I actually, like I have it, it's on a Google drive, any chiropractor who wants you're, that, you're, you're my vaccine vaccine. class. Oh my God. Yes. So that I will be happy to share. And so it is one that I will just literally, no, I won't put the link. I will somehow I like to control the link a little bit. Yeah. So yeah, I may have people like, reach out to me. Yeah. Yes. Reach, reach out to me and I will happily give it to you. Cause the deal is it stays within you and your family and it can stay within the chiropractic family, but it cannot go to the pediatricians because honestly, like we know that there's concerns. We know that there's people that, yeah. have, yes. So I just, I don't want to go there. My kids are too young is a good way to say that. Okay. But I will share it. I will happily share it to anyone who ever asks, because I know how much time I've put into it. There, well, then we look at Heidi Havoc, like for CEs, like we brought Heidi Havoc, we flew her in to teach one of our weekend seminars in the state. And it was huge and wonderful. And not every state's willing to do that. My biggest belief, and this is where I love my state and I will make this statement because people will hear it. I don't like, I go to my state association um, seminars and conventions because I love the people here. The fact that I have chiropractic around and it fills me up, but the speaker, they normally choose really musculoskeletal and a lot of rehab and a lot of laser. And I go, that's wonderful. That's not what I do. And I really wish would bring in. And the answer is, well, I teach all the time and not always does my stuff count as CE. So I don't choose CEs for the state and for my license based on what I want to know. I go to all these seminars that I pay really good money for, for the information, for the certainty, for the research articles that I could grab for me, not for my patients. Like I said, I don't care to convince my patients. My patients don't come to me because of the research. They come to me because I have a knowingness and I do take care of them at a very high level. And I don't have to prove that to my patients. And that's like, people think that we have to prove it. It's like, no, serve and know and have conviction and certainty at such a high level, but you have to be willing to acknowledge I'm not certain. I don't have the conviction. It's the other reason that I coach. It's like the whole idea of me coaching is not a business side and not, it's no, it's so you can be the very best doctor you can be. And I coach one-on-one -on -one for that reason, because it's like to help people through their hiccups and their head spaces and their life and everything else. So it's really when I'm going to find a mentor group, find a doctor to coach with, find your tribe to help you be the very best doctor you can be. And if you are just doing the same old, same old, and it's not fulfilling you, then you better up level. This is a great time to decide how to up level and where do you want to go? And at the same time, the whole mindset of like, we better want to keep on learning. I learned from Dr. Hall, like he was teaching at Parker and I will tell you, he was much meaner when he taught us as students than he is with the ICPA. And I love that man because he pushed us to go, holy shit, there's so much to this. Yeah. And I maybe have a 10th of it, yep. but the 10th of it is enough for me to totally appreciate, not understand every tract and how it all works, but to understand, holy shit, there's so much intelligence in the body. The body's so brilliant. It does not need me to do anything to it. It simply needs me to come in and remove any interference from the system and then sit back and honor and appreciate and support the body as it heals and repairs and have this belief of when to adjust, how to adjust, when not to adjust, a schedule of care so that I know a patient is getting well. I know, like, wh why do we do once a week? Like, what if they need every day and you put them on once a week? It's like, you look at those type of things and we never talk schedules because heaven forbid, no one talks schedules and we piss each other off. But my answer is if you don't know when your patient needs to be adjusted and when they don't need to be adjusted, you're probably not seeing them often enough to figure that out. Mm, I, I would like very, that. yeah, I would very much love, and I say this all the time on patients, here's the schedule I'm putting you on to check you. The goal 
is that you don't need to be adjusted every time. And then we figure out the schedule that you really need to continue to heal through this. But rather than me thinking I'm smarter than your body, and I know you only need three times a week, or I know you only need twice because you're doing all these other healthy things. Let's be honest, all of our yoga instructors are like the worst when it comes to their spine. And when you look at their x-rays. And so it's not that the healthy lifestyle precludes chiropractic care. Sometimes that healthy lifestyle has actually made things worse because they thought they knew everything. And then they have poor biomechanics. We'll just stick there for a second. Poor biomechanics that they overstress on a repetitive basis and they cause further breakdown, further degeneration, but yet I'm doing everything right. Mm -hmm. And the answer is, well, actually everything right, but not at the right time. So do you start new patients on five times a week? Mm -hmm. Why is this controversial? Is this you know, and it shouldn't be. But I say, you clammed up more there than no. I've, I've talked well, no, about. Only because we're changing schedules. We're actually going to four days a week starting in January. Okay. And so that's, we've had to have that philosophical conversation going, well, if we're no longer open five days a week, what do we do for our patients on those weekends? And my answer is, I want sustainability for the doctors that work for me because I have associates and I've changed this because I want long-term. Like I really have learned to appreciate long-term for chiropractors and sustainability and sustainability is like my favorite word because I want doctors to stay in this profession, not blow out their bodies and not blow out their health. What is it? And I go four days a week is sustainable. And I firmly believe that if a patient needs that five days a week, then you better double them up one of those days. Mm -hmm. So we are happy to start patients on twice a day. We'll have patients come in twice a day when they start, especially a baby failure to thrive. Those babies are slowly dying. You better check those babies very quickly, very often, adjust them when needed. And you'll see miracles happen in the first week or two. Like it's so freaking cool to see that. How do we make it through these weekends? Well, it may actually require us to be on call for a little while as we're processing through these patients and figure it out. But like, it is a philosophical hit that I'm having by changing our schedule to four days and say, but what about? And the answer is no, I believe the body's really powerful and intelligent. We better be on our game those four days to make sure we're taking care of people appropriately. So you brought up your docs and sustainability. And I had written down when you said that 51% mm -hmm. is now female. Um, I don't know if we know the exit rate. Right. So. Yep. Um, one of the things, so I, I, I want your opinion on it, but I'm going to say, I firmly believe that currently we do not have good support and ideas of systems and success. And that 51% like success rate, it, it has nothing to do with that. They have a vagina. It has to do with the, well, it actually does because they have children, yeah, they have children. And they have maternity leave and they have boobs that they yep. want to provide food for because it's a part of the chiropractic mindset. And so we have all of these women coming in and then we're like, but if you're a real chiropractor do you better see them four days a week and you better yep. be available. Yes. Yep. And but I you also should breastfeed. Mm -hmm. Yep. as long as possible. And you should also take a six month maternity leave yep. and like balance mental health. And it's like, we don't have good systems. Nope. So I think the other part that I'll say, and I'm going to first confront the success. I'm a huge believer in success is whatever success needs to be for you right now. And so as a lot of my docs are getting pregnant and having babies, some of them are looking at associates because they're ready for associates. Some of them are looking at coverage. Some of them are just shutting the practice down because they don't have coverage and they don't have options and they're going to take some time off. And so we help them leverage time and money so they can do those things, but they know they're going to have to come back sooner than if they had an associate or head coverage. And so now we redefine what does your practice look like? And I think that's the biggest mistake that we've made in this profession for women. I came into the state and I ran a practice like a male because that's all I knew. That's all I had modeled. That was all I had for coaching. And so I had my babies and somehow I made it to a year for nursing each of them. And which means that there was a lot of pumping and there was a lot of goat's milk that was included because there was no way I could provide for them because my kids are high stress level anxiety, like their mother is, and we would feed off each other. So to have them in the practice, just, I right. never even yeah. thought I, I never even thought I could, I guess that's the other part. So here's what's so cool about this now is we're saying to women, and we should be saying to women, how do you see this? And, and I sit down, I say, let's not even talk the next two years. Let's just talk the next six months. How does this look for the next six months? You can always add time later. The thing I don't want docs to do is to keep on playing with their schedule. So I would rather have them come back at a very part-time basis 
and be able to see patients, love on those patients that they see and have people say, well, I want to see you and go, well, sorry, I'm booked out two months. There's nothing wrong with that. Like, it's totally cool to be booked out two weeks, four weeks, six weeks for a new patient, because instead of us feeling I have to serve them all right now, the answer is I can serve you when I'm ready to serve you. And that's when the next opening is. And I think that's where we need to balance the heart with the business side of going right now, this is working for me. And I really enjoy it like this. Mm -hmm. And then now there's no judgment and we don't have to convince anyone else. And we don't have to convince ourselves. One of my other favorite words when I'm coaching is compassion and grace. We need to have more compassion and grace for ourselves because we sure as hell give a lot of compassion and grace to our patients and to our population and to the medical doctors and all like we just talked about all this compassion we give to everyone else, but it stops with us. Mm -hmm. And that's so sad. And it's like, I've gone through lots of years of therapy over the last few years. And that's one of the biggest things I pulled through it was compassion and grace and stop judging myself so harshly. I've done the very best that I can with every situation I've gone through. And I've gone through some big situations. And at the same time, I'm grateful because I'm now on the other end of those. I'm grateful for what I've learned through them. And I've really come back to each practice has to be unique. And mm -hmm. if you're serving your family and you're able to take care of other people, great. I think instead of like, I have a doc that's moving back into the state that was one of my associates and I'm super excited to see her again. I know she ran a super tiny clinic out of her home, probably on like the lowdown when she was in another state as she was having her babies. And I'm like, that's success. Mm -hmm. The fact that you could stay home with your kids. And I don't care if you saw two people, like there's no number that matters, right. but if you, and you wanted, and you felt this need to continue in chiropractic care, that's my first goal stay in the profession, like stay right. in it, but serve however that looks. And some people will say, and this is my financial situation. Well, I can't take that much time off. And I don't have a partner who's able to provide all this income. So it's me. As soon as I became a chiropractor and graduated, like I've been the primary bread earner for our family. I didn't have that luxury. But what I did have was a massively supportive spouse who was happy to take on more of the parenting responsibility so that I could run the practice. Yep. And I think that's the other part is we feel, let's be totally honest for a moment. Most men who become chiropractors, their wife serves as a CA. Yep. Done. It's already there. Somehow for them, it's totally okay. For us women, when we have a practice, we don't have our husbands as a CA. And so instead, um, it's like, well, we got to do it all ourselves. And the answer is no, you just got to get really good at communication. And you got to get really good at saying, again, time and place. What is success right now? Because what I think is going to happen is that we're going to see women that are going to drift in and out of the profession during their children's years. Yeah. And I have teenagers and my teenagers need me more than I would have expected. When they were toddlers, I knew they needed me, but I somehow thought when they're teenagers, I would have more time in the practice. Right. And I made that mistake. I put more time in the practice and my kids started having massive issues and it, it didn't quickly teach me. I, I'm a slow learner. Sometimes it, I had to go enough times to the police and things like that with my kids. It wasn't quite that bad, but kind of, um, to realize, holy shit, they're screaming that they need me home. And so I, I quickly changed. And that's the other cool thing. We can pivot at any point, you guys, like chiropractors, we are in charge of our own destiny. So much freedom. So Pivot. much freedom. Yes. And so as soon as I pivoted, I'm home more and I'm support, I'm at every single sporting event for my kids. And I love that my mom was at my sporting event. So it's like, that's a huge value for me, for my kids and go, I can always go back to practice. My kids, like my kids know it. And we joke, they're like, mom, you'd be so much more successful if you didn't have kids. I go like money wise, they know that. And I'm like, oh yeah. Oh, hell yeah. I would be, but I love you kids. And I love, and success is my kids and success is what it is. And I always know I can amp up. So for all the women listening, you can always amp up at some point, if that's what you feel that you want to do, but don't ever do anything in this profession because someone else tells you, you should, if it doesn't feel right. I think that's the mistake that we have is that we're having other people decide our fate rather than having even a guide or a mentor that says, Hey, let's help figure success for you. And it's okay that it's six months at a time. Yep. Yep. That's a lot more work, but that's also the ability to say that life is fluid. And as we have our babies and as we breastfeed and then as they grow, it's like, yeah, it's all changing. And I think that's the support and the structures and the procedures that we need to work harder on for each other. So agree. 
Um, so how does somebody work with you? How do people, how do people find more from you? How do they get all the Christina in their life? Thank you. I love it. So I practice evolution is the coaching program that I took over from my mentor. That's one of the cool things I like to share with this. Like I went through it as a doc, totally changed my practice in a principled subluxation based corrective care mindset. And so I took over in 2017 and what I've really brought to it is continued systems and procedures. We give you everything you need. And it's not just everything you need. It's like from the heart. It's like, if I could have said it, in the very best way, when I was most on purpose, when I was most on fire, this is what I would say. And it's like, there it is. And so now you can serve from your heart because I help you and I help your team and I help the systems and procedures all come together. And then my number one goal is to help you be the very best doctor you can be. And so I do a lot of one-on-one coaching. And so I take very few clients as a result because I'm still in practice and I'm a mom and business owner and we're moving and bought a space and all these crazy, wonderful things. And so it's really something that you can tell, like, I hope you can tell, I love this profession. I will serve this profession. I will leave my number one goal is to leave this profession better than I found it. And when I get to work with other doctors and see their success and help them through, it's like, it isn't only like affirming, but it really is how we serve and how we, we go to the next level. So reach out to me through practiceevolution.com. My um, email, we'll throw it in there as well, is Dr. Christina at practiceevolution.com. Um, I was kicked off Facebook, so you will not find me on Facebook. <laughs> you were kicked off Facebook? So yes. it was, yeah, like it was someone hacked and put some horrible things um, under my name. And Facebook has deemed me ineligible to have anything on Facebook right now. So I'm learning Instagram better. So I am on Instagram, it's Christina Killstitcher. um, But I'm learning old school going, hey, you know that email list that you were always told is a really good goal and I had it, (laughs) luckily. But I have to, it honestly has helped me really look at my life and go, you're doing a lot right when like I, I lost my business page through Facebook, like they systematically shut me down and go, Ooh, girl, this better fire you up more because something big, you just like, I probably pissed someone off or it just happened. And I'm like, Nope, we need to serve at a big level. And somehow it will all work out. And it does. I think just a lot of people are like, what the hell happened to Christina? Nope. She's around just uh, uh, not there. You're ineligible. <laughs> I'm in a badge of honor. (laughs) I know that's right. Yeah. You can tell I'm holding those words very well. I go, thanks people. But yes. So please reach out because it's one. And then I will tell you within MC2 and and tonal pediatrics is the the day that I teach the second day. Um, I'm still teaching within that. I love that. I love teaching. I love going to schools. If there's students that are listening, you guys like I will go, I will fly. I don't ask for the payment from the schools at all. Like I will go and serve at the schools and teach and share. And I love to give back. It's one of the reasons I taught as faculty, but yet I realized with teaching as faculty, I I miss my practice. I, my heart is served by being in practice. And so to me, I have the best life where I can teach on my time frame. I can coach and I can be in practice and I can have this amazing life that I determine and, and that I am, that I'm living right now. You're incredible. You're it's incredible. Uh, this was awesome to like meet you and like you're wonderful. You uh, okay? So you're gonna go look up an enneagram eight. Eight. Don't yes. get offended. Most okay. eights won't. Um, <laughs> Does eights what? Because eight an eight won't get offended. If you're okay. actually an eight, you won't be offended. If you're not an oh, eight, wow. you're gonna be like, "Fuck you, Laura." What the hell? <laughs> exactly. So here's okay, why cool. I think you're an eight. You have a you like to go to research. Eights go to five. Um, so there's a lot of like when they're pissed off eights, like Mm. really dig into like that. Um, you also love to serve and like, there is, um, yeah, Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you're a wing nine or seven though. I'm not that good. We second meeting. We'll figure that out. (laughs) I love it. Okay. I'll look it up. All right. She slayers, uh, check out those links below. Um, I'm going to actually tell Christina that she should make a like summarized thing to like a free download in exchange yep. for that email. So you can build that email. Well, actually, list. I actually, I already have one. So it's a PDF, it's an infant exam. So oh. I will grab it and I will send it to you. So it's an okay. infant exam super. And I, and here's my, and here's now my other little pedestal I'll put on. We need to be doing exams. You guys, like I love scanning technology. I have them in my op practice. If you don't get your hands on a patient and explain to the parents what you're seeing, why it matters, the parents aren't going to understand it past when your scans go white. So you've Mm -hmm. got to be able to have both of them and it doesn't have to take a ton of time, but you got to understand and be able to explain neurology. So there it is. I'll give you an infant exam. Super simple and super powerful. 
Perfect. So yeah. that'll be below in the show notes. So until next week, she slayers. Bye. Mm-hmm.